Father, thank you for creating marriage and all its beautiful design. Thank you for all the blessings that flow from it. Um, thank you, God, for including us in the picture of your love for the church, using us, Lord, but there's a heavy responsibility that, that comes with that. Uh, we don't want to lie about you. And so help us, uh, Lord, to view dating as we need to by understanding um, the great picture that marriage is and help us to learn all that we can learn about ourselves um, as well as about other people and, and, and in time that, that one person in particular. Help us to learn all we can, Lord, so that we are entering um, into this um, great commitment, this great responsibility with as much knowledge as we can to make wise choices, Lord, because we want to enjoy this gift of marriage and we want to honor you through it and we want to be thankful, Lord. So help us during this time, please, to continue to understand these principles from your word and uh, may it spark up um, questions and uh, as well as just things to be clarified so that ultimately, Lord, we're living our lives according to the objective principles of your word. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me start off with a, just a little picture of marriage that was shared with me before I was married that I, found, I actually found very helpful. A good friend of mine said to me, he said, he said, Nick, if you have if you have the right woman at your side, you can conquer the world. If you have the right woman at your side, you can conquer the world. Is that true? Men, is that true? I can certainly say that it is. That, that statement has proved true in the 20 years of marriage that I've enjoyed. Having the right woman at my side enabled me to feel like I could conquer the world. At times when, uh, when I needed encouragement because I was discouraged in some regard, felt that I had failed, felt that a challenge was too great for me, the knowledge that I had a, an, a cheerleader at my side, not to just turn the wife's position into, into a cheerleader, but yet that's one of the great roles that she plays, to have that cheerleader at my side uh, when others perhaps were not so uh, in my favor made all the difference in the world. And so we see, as we've looked over these last few weeks, we see that, that God has brought Adam and Eve together. And they are called to do something that is huge, exercise dominion over all of creation. And God declared that it was not enough, not good, that man do this alone. And so he made woman. And he made woman to be by his side, he made her out of his side to be by his side, and to be that necessary helpmate so that he can do what God has called him to do. And so this is the picture of, of marriage that we have, a man and a woman exercising dominion over creation with the man in the lead and the woman as the helper that God has blessed him with so that he can do what God has called him to do. So if you look at Genesis 2.15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So he's making it clear that Adam, in particular, was granted lordship in the Garden. And it was under God's ultimate sovereignty that this was granted. And so Adam is, by God's designation, the leader. He is the Lord. But this is not the, it's not a position of privilege to be the Lord. It's it's, a, it's actually one of obligation. He's the servant leader. 
He's the one who's called to nurture. He's the one who's called to protect. And so the man is this servant Lord. And the woman, as his helper, is to be the servant helper in this process. And so this, this is a beautiful relationship. And this is the relationship that God created, that he intended, and called it very good. And then sin enters into the picture in Genesis chapter 3. And the world, in its sin, it seeks to reject this good design that God has, that he's, he's created. And through Christ, though, this, that which has fallen can be redeemed. The relationship can be restored. There's nothing demeaning uh, here in this, in this relationship that God has created between a man and a woman. There's nothing demeaning for the woman in her role as a helper. Her, her ministry is defined here in relation to the man. The woman was given to the man not for his whims, no, but for his, his character. Right? A woman will, will not be fulfilled by supplanting a man in his God-given role as the leader. Rather, through her help, the man is actually made able to lead. She elevates the man to true masculinity. She's the one who is able to be by his side and make him feel like he can conquer the world. That's God's beautiful design for you ladies to be that role, that significant role in helping your husband fulfill the role that God has called him to do. So rather than through, uh, through it's, it's through her help that the man is made able to lead. So helper, being the helper is not a position for Eve to fight. It's a function that God has designed her to fulfill. And this is why in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul calls the woman man's glory. She's man's glory for she plays this significant role in his life. And so the result of God's design was, the, was this perfect companionship. And we spent a couple of weeks looking and, and building this picture of perfect companionship. Uh, she was exactly what Adam needed. So now we want to look at, the, at some of the building blocks that lead towards this marriage relationship. And this isn't the full picture of each of these things, but these are some of the things that are essential. How, how does the brief, this, this was a very brief reminder of God's de design for marriage, how does this picture now that we see relate back to dating and to relationships? Well, is this supposed to make those who are single feel that they have no life until they get married? No, that's, that's not the idea. Not at all. Um, because as important as marriage is, as important a relationship as marriage is, it's not the most important relationship in your life. No, the most important relationship in every Christian's life is his or her, her relationship with Christ. Singles, uh, while they certainly may long to be married and desire and look forward to it, uh, singles can be content. And they, can, they should be purposeful in their service to God while they have the most freedom to do that. Um, but if we're going to, to biblically understand the relationship between men and women, we have to start with the way that God made things. So if, if Genesis 1 and 2 present God's, God's purpose in marriage... And if our view of dating is directed towards marriage, as we said it should be, then this tells us not only what we're aiming at, but also much more how to build a relationship in that direction. So a key verse that tells us much about the relationship that marriage involves is Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. So let's turn there, and then um, who'd like to read that verse? Genesis 2, 24 and 5.
and step up to the mic. Don't be afraid. Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Jonah, thank you. Yep. Uh, so for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and, she, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. So this, this verse gives us a picture of what marriage involves. And it shows us three ways that bind a man and a woman together in marriage. And they also serve to define a healthy dating relationship. And the three things that, are, that this verse speaks about is commitment, intimacy, and interdependence. So first, commitment. Commitment is, absolutely necess- is, a, is an absolutely necessary component of any relationship, if it's going to at all picture like what we see here with Adam and Eve. And Moses tells us that for the sake of a woman, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we've heard this as leaving and cleaving. Leaving and cleaving to another is what commitment is all about. And a dating relationship is moving towards, that that is moving towards marriage will have more and more commitment as time goes on. So commitment involves cleaving. That is, it's, it's uniting together into a new relationship. Uh, as a dating relationship grows, m- more substance is going to develop in this relationship, and the man and the woman are each going to have more of themselves invested into the relationship. So let me ask you, what does is, what is commitment involve within a relationship? How would you define commitment within a relationship? And this is not just, I'm not talking just dating. I'm talking about commitment within a relationship. What does that look like? It involves sacrifice. What else? Faithfulness. Very good. Oh, very good. That's right. That's right. All these come together to to, to create the picture that we need to have, that we need to understand when we're going... Uh, towards marriage, there is an increasing, uh, no one really mentioned this, but it, it, it fits within here too, there's, there's an increasing exclusivity, right, within commitment in terms of, of relationship with others. It, it means that we're, we're giving more time to the relationship. It involves a growing attention to the needs of others, and, and as we become aware of those needs, we sacrifice, right? And as we face different things, we, we, we bind together even though things may be rough, and we stay committed as, as we go through different seasons of life, and we remain faithful. So at the start, so that's the, that's the picture of commitment within a relationship, but at the start, on the first date, there's there should be little to no commitment. Little to no commitment. The, the couple's not likely to be dating exclusively. Uh, there's, there's little expectation for each to give time to the other, uh, to make immense sacrifices for the other person on the fourth date. That, that's, that's outside the boundaries at this point. And while they seek to be a help and a blessing to each other, even on the first date, that, that should be part of your desire to be a help, to be a blessing to the other person. Their obligation is little higher than that towards just simply another brother or sister in Christ. So that's where it begins, with little to no commitment. But if that relationship, if that relationship that at some point has that first date, if that relationship is the one that turns into marriage, well, then a great deal will have changed by the time you're saying, I do, at the altar. 
Right? The man is completely committed. He's loving his wife as Christ loves the church. He's, he's practicing the kind of self-sacrifice for her that Jesus demonstrated for us on the cross. And the woman, she's no less committed. Uh, she's submitting herself wholly to the authority of the man as the church submits to Christ. So between the first date and the wedding, this, this commitment, it must grow if this relationship is going to flourish. It has to. So along with cleaving to one another, that there must also be leaving. As commitment um, to another person grows, parts of the old life have to be left behind. They have to be, or, or at least adjusted to a certain respect. The man is going to spend probably far less time with his friends, far less time pursuing uh, other things that he was able to do uh, while he was a single man. The woman may spend far less time with her friends or talking to them on the phone or things of that nature. And both begin to rely less on family and on friends as they, learn, as they begin to rely more and more on each other. So old, old priorities, old allegiances, they give way to this growing partnership of the man and the woman. Um, I think we can all agree that one of the, one of the uh, trends of our culture nowadays is that there seems to be less and less a desire to make this commitment. Especially, I would say, especially among men today. They're less inclined or reluctant to commit. Why do you think that's so? Why do we have the age of marriage getting higher and higher? Any thoughts on that? Step up to the mic, Francis. <laughs> I don't want these mics to hinder you from making comments, so... You know, I, uh, just a thought, um, in our home fellowship group, we've been studying fellowship and what hinders that. And a lot of what hinders that nowadays in our culture is the, our social media and how that's kind of trained us. And how inherently things like, you know, Facebook, Instagram is uh, kind of self-centered in, in a way. And because of that, um, some of the stats that we discussed were the median age for marriage has continued to increase as the social media technology continues to kind of influence the culture. And a lot of that is because we just, we've kind of lost the, the social aspect of, of getting to know one another because we, we do this now. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of why relationships maybe don't flourish as they used to is because um, that's kind of influenced how we do relationships now. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's one, one direction, not, you know, not, a, not a discussion or an or a interaction. And so We're losing some of the skills of, of interacting with yeah, one another? Yeah, it's like, why, you know, why would I, why would I want to go out and hang out with and get to know people where I can just read their profile um, and get to know them that way? And this way, it's safe. I don't have to invest in that relationship and maybe not be vulnerable to get hurt or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I can just stay in my own silo and create my own world and let people in that I want and leave people out that I want out <laughs> and like what I like and don't like what I don't like. And so uh, hinders fellowship for sure, but it certainly has stunted uh, a social aspect to fellowship um, and thereby relationship. And mm -hmm. the connection of uh, the median age for marriage just getting increasing is kind of a fruit of that so yeah yeah what what is um what are, why are so many singles today and i would say especially men why are they reluctant to commit what's the what's keeping men from feeling and i'm, I'm zeroing in on men but i'm sure it's not just men but i think predominantly so go ahead andy i'm speaking more globally not specifically the church although i think it's bridging in the church a little but if there's much freer um, room for, for the acceptance of physical intimacy, why, why does a man need to get married? It's 
he can get what he wants without really committing, mm -hmm. he's going to stop right there. Very good. Good observation, yeah. Nancy? Well, I think we've seen this since the 60s, that free love is and fornication are glorified. And I think it's being taken to an extreme, mostly with women, but men too, that there is a lot more flesh being shown. And it's just out there. And to me, it's, um, it's very openly pornographic and suggestive. And it, it's accepted in our culture that it's OK to just flaunt yourself out there and fornicate, and that, that that's actually a desirable thing. That's my perception anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes, it, it, those two comments I obviously go, go hand in hand, um, that why, the, the, the male mind, I think, especially is vulnerable to thinking, why would I limit myself when there's so many options available? And uh, when I don't, if I limit myself, I'm going to limit my fun. I'm going to limit my experience and so forth. Ronnie. I think it's because we have a, a me-centric culture that uh, everything is about me. Um, that why would I look out for somebody else's interest instead of just looking out for number one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our, our heart is most certainly prone to go in that direction. We have to fight against that current within ourselves. Um, yeah, so if I, yeah, Joanna, yes. I think that's also an idea of what young is. And so instead of it just being young, like a young teenager or teenager, mm -hmm. it's now a young adult, so you're not really an adult, and therefore you're not really <laughs> that adult until you're older where you can settle down and, you know, get married and do all those things. And so that idea of marriage gets pushed away too because you're still young and right no that's a good observation too think about how many in, in, in recent years think how f how we have pushed adulthood further and, and, and further out you know even our um, you know even the adjustments that are being made to let's say health care right your your son who's over 18 who can no longer um, it used to be that when they're over 18, they can't be on your policy anymore. Isn't it now up to age like 26 or something like that? We, we, we keep pushing things out to allow our, our uh, children who are growing up, really they're grown up, to continue to remain um, with, with decreasing amounts of, dependent, uh, of responsibility and things like that. So yeah, the trend of our culture is, is to push it all out further and further away. So... But I think the underlying cause is, was, was certainly highlighted here. We, uh, we simply want to enjoy the benefits of being in a relationship without giving up anything from our former lives. Why, if I can get it without giving up, I think I'll go after it. And that, 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 that permeates our culture. Uh, I, I'd rather receive without giving all that I, in the past, would have thought I had to give. Many are just afraid to, that if I limit myself to one person, um, then the moment I limit myself to one person, oh, what about all these other options that are out there? I've, I've heard people say, hey, variety is the spice of life, you know, and no, that's the exact opposite. No, it's the commitment. That's the exact opposite of what's true, the commitment to another person and getting to know another person and being known by another person is actually the joy and the satisfaction, the true satisfaction within a relationship. And we'll actually touch on that more in the next one when we look at intimacy. So we're looking at commitment. So commitment is realized through faithfulness. Commitment is realized through faithfulness, which also happens to be one of the most glorious attributes of our God. God wants men to be faithful. And, and there's one relationship above all others on earth, earth where, where this is both demanded and developed, and that's marriage. 
We're to be faithful to one another in different respects, but marriage is a whole other category. God demands that you be faithful there, and he develops your faithfulness within marriage. So God, he's relegated the blessings of love with the member of an opposite sex to marriage. Why? Why has he limited the benefits and the blessings of commitment or, or of marriage uh, to that relationship? Because commitment defines it. Because that's the safest place for these things to be enjoyed. Enjoying the full blessings of marriage are only for those who are willing to assume the expectations and the obligations that go along with this relationship. See, it's protection. It's protection for you so that you can fully enjoy this gift that God's created. I relegate it to marriage. So a dating relationship that that is growing towards marriage is one in which the man and the woman are growing at a, at a pace, at a, at a slow pace. They're growing in confidence towards each other as the expectations and the agreements uh, are, begin to be faithfully met. That's one of the ways that you know that I think I can, I can marry this person because I've seen over time that they're committed and that commitment has grown healthily in a healthy manner and it's grown slowly, but it's definitely there. So commitment is one of those things that has to be present, according to Genesis 2, 24 and 25. The second dynamic of, of the marriage relationship is described there is intimacy. He says, uh, in, he says that the committed couple, they, they, become, they shall become one flesh. It says of, it says of Adam and Eve that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So men, men and women are made by God to experience the most intimate ministry together. They're to experience this intimacy spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And because God made men and women to enjoy a deep intimacy, there's, there's, also, there's also much damage that can be done. When, when the bonds that are forged by intimacy are broken. And, and for this reason, commitment is vital for a healthy, a healthy intimacy. So, so just given that much, why, why do you think God has restricted sexual intercourse to marriage? It's absolutely binding. Now, granted, we, we have a culture that says that, that it, it's not binding, but, but they're lost. They're, they're lost in their sin. They're dark in, they're in their understanding. They don't understand that they're binding and, and then separating and over and over and over again if that's their lifestyle. And, and he's restricted it to marriage because only marriage possesses the necessary commitment that's needed to make it safe for our hearts. Remember, our hearts are involved here. Um, a, a great example that shows the contrast here, the nature of, of the commitment, of the relationship that's involved in marriage. They shall become one flesh, we're told, Moses tells us. If you decide that you want a different door in your house, let's say it's your front door, you want to you want to get a more ornate door for your front door. What does it take for you to get a new door? What do you have to do? Okay, you got the money part. Let's say you got the door. <laughs> What's the actual, what does it actually involve? Okay. How do you do that? Handy men, how do you, how do, you do that? Handy men or handy women? <laughs> no saws all. Uh, Yes, you just, have you ever taken a door off a hinge? You just use a little screwdriver, pop the pin out, pop the pin out, pop the pin out, and you just take it off. Is that door damaged? No, you can, you can move it to another part in the house if you want, and you can put the new door right on, and so forth. You just simply replace it. Now, imagine that you're one of those types who, who really enjoys working in the yard, 
and you've decided to do something rather different, you're going to graft two trees together. And so you start by, by taking one tree, and, you, and, one, and, and I don't, actually don't know the process of it, but let's just say you take a, a, a part of a shoot from another tree, and, and you put them together in such a way, you make a cut and put it together, and as that thing grows, you've got two different trees now that are visibly different, but they're growing together as one. And let's say 10 years down the road, that tree there is in the front yard and it's starting to take some shape that you don't like. And you say, you know what? I think I'm, gonna, I think I'm actually going to plant these two trees separately now. How's that process going to work for you? It's not going to work. You're going to kill one or both of those trees when you separate those trees that are grafted together. There's going to be a tearing because they have grown together as one. So our culture looks at marriage as if it's just replacing the door on the hinge. But God says, no, you're tearing apart two trees that have been grafted together. Both are damaged irreparably. It's there whether you like it or not. That's really the picture here that we have here. Separating two hearts that have been united emotionally and and especially when they're united sexually, it's not taking a door off a hinge. It's, it's ripping apart two trees that have been grafted together. Their, their hearts, God says, have become one. And they cannot be separated without damage being done to both. And moreover, intimacy involves, it involves uncovering yourself, exposing yourself. They were both naked, the scripture says. Right? But one of the things that we should realize is, is it's very, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are driven towards exposing ourselves uh, emotionally within relationships. And, and, and oftentimes that's one of the things that we, are, we, we do rather readily when, before we have any reason to be doing this, to be exposing our hearts to another person. We rush into this because it... It does feel so good to be known by someone else, to be able to trust someone else. But many times we rush into this within a relationship before we have any foundation for such a trust to reveal. It's foolish to expose the secrets of your heart to someone who has not made a tangible commitment to faithfulness to you. So intimacy should follow commitment proportionally. So as a relationship grows towards marriage, as there is increasing levels of commitment being demonstrated and shown, then that naturally leads to an increasing amount of intimacy, a sharing of one another's lives. So the context for enjoying intimacy by God's design and enjoying it to its fullest sense is within a fully committed relationship. Just as commitment is followed uh, through with faithfulness, intimacy is realized through sharing. Intimacy is realized through sharing. Yeah, Andy. Can you clarify how you're using intimacy in that point? Mm -hmm. Saying that there should be an increasing intimacy. Yeah. Is I, that I, universal? Intimacy or? is a general term here. I'm not talking about just that which is um, physical intimacy. Intimacy is emotional, intimacy is spiritual, as well as physical. And so we, uh, we've already designated that physical intimacy, God has clearly set it aside for that relationship where there is full commitment to one another, which would be marriage. But there's still a relational intimacy that is growing over time. So thanks if that was confusing. Thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, so in, uh, commitment is fulfilled through faithfulness. Intimacy is realized through this sharing, through sharing of one another. With, within a relationship, you share your hopes, you share your dreams, you share, you share your pasts, you share your future, you share your burdens, you share your cares. So it, it's a wonderful blessing to have someone with whom you can share your fears and your pain 
and your passions and your joys. That's, that's the beauty of a relationship. That's, that's really what we're longing for, is to have that other person to share our lives with. And as a dating relationship grows towards marriage, then an increasing amount of sharing is going to be taking place within the hearts and the minds of the couple. And then the third thing is, uh, the third element of a marriage is interdependence. The marriage relationship involves an interdependence. Uh, when you marry, you're, you're not just two people who are doing your own thing. You, know, you are a team. You are a, a new team that has been forged. And you're going to work together at pretty much everything. I remember, and I've, I've shared this in, in various contexts, I remember realizing that we're going to do everything together. That was my wife's view of marriage. And it was pretty much my view, but I didn't realize how everything was everything. I, I mean, I think after our honeymoon came back, we were in our new place together, and within the first week, the, the way things worked in the house I grew up in with my parents was uh, my dad, when he was tired, announced, I'm going to bed. Or maybe he didn't even announce it. He just looked around. He wasn't there anymore. He was already up in bed asleep. That was what I saw. So I remember, I remember we were, Rosita and I were downstairs, and I said, oh, well, I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. And she's like, well, wait for me. That was, it was dawning on me at that moment. Oh, things, things might be a little different here than I thought. It's like, I'm just going to bed. I'll be right upstairs. Well, I want to go with you. I want to do all things together. And that's, that's what marriage should be. I'm not saying that you can't go off to bed at separate times. However, I must admit that that's, a very, that's one little practical thing that has, has kept us from allowing little, little offshoots of independence that aren't necessarily healthy for the relationship to develop. You know, the fact that I, I may be very tired, but I wait until Rosita's done doing the things that she might need to be doing, wrapping things up. There's times where I'll just, I'll just lay down on the couch while she's finishing something up downstairs. I won't go up. Uh, I won't go upstairs and go to bed without her. It's just one of those little practical things that emphasizes our interdependence. We are together. Even every day, we end the day together at the same time. And it's that if, if, I fall, if I should happen to get into bed and fall asleep before her, I usually hear about it the next day. You fell asleep before I got into bed. I'm sorry, I was tired. <laughs> so you can take away from that as, as you would like, but, it, but it's, it's just one of those things. This is a new relationship where you depend on each other. And the more you promote that, uh, the more the benefits flow. The more that you promote doing your own thing when you want it and feel like it and so forth, the more that gets promoted, the, the, those bonds of, int of, of intimacy and interdependence are weakened by that. Not necessarily irreparably. But I think they are. Little practical things like this. So neither the man nor the woman can succeed in their calling without the input and the involvement of the other. That's God's design. You're one now. So you don't just go do things. One of the first places that you go for counsel should be your spouse. What do you think about this, honey? Something I'm thinking about. Well, I know you've been thinking about it because I know you and you've been preoccupied. You know, just This is the way a relationship grows and develops and matures. So if you plan to grow towards marriage, then you, you, you must learn how to work together. You, uh, uh, one practical thing uh, that, that a couple or a potential couple should be doing is serving the Lord together. right? As singles... Paul recommends that you use your singlehood to the most advantage in serving Christ. And so a very practical thing that you should be doing 
is serving Christ alongside some of these potential prospects that you're assessing and, and considering. Serve alongside them. Watch them in action. Serve together. Be a team. Begin to look how you, how you uh, support one another and how you interact with one another when situations are a little tense sometimes in different scenarios. How do you communicate when you're trying to go towards a mutual goal? All of this can be in the early stages and, and in a very safe and good environment. All this can be experienced right within the church, serving alongside each other. All right, so let me, I need to change up here and go to, so we, we've, we've seen now God's, God's good design for marriage. And Adam and, in, Adam and Eve, they enjoyed the paradise of the garden, right? They had, a, they had a beautiful relationship. There was no sin that clouded their love. There were, there were no arguments over, over petty things. They, they enjoyed a wonderful intimacy that's, to a certain degree, no longer possible uh, for, for us who, who always really have something to hide. We always have something that we're hiding. We're, we can never fully set aside our own selfish motives and our own selfish desires. So Adam and Eve enjoyed something that everybody after them has never been able to fully enjoy this side of heaven. And Moses put it this way in, in verse 25. Genesis 2, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. But, but as we know, something happened. Why is, here's a question for you. Why is love so hard between a man and a woman today? Why is it so hard? Um, I, well, from, from my perspective, I think there's a certain amount of vulnerability and uh, making yourself available on multiple levels emotionally. And when you, when you do that, you're setting yourself up to possibly be hurt and people are afraid to be hurt. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, um, when, I guess when you're looking to fall in love with someone, there's the differences between you and them that have to kind of intermesh that they may not be completely truthful, you may not be completely truthful because you want to put kind of your best self forward. Mm -hmm. And so that can create a dynamic for starting off on kind of the wrong foot and things of that nature. Right, good, those are, those, those are some Correct observations. Yeah, Ronnie, why is love so hard between a man and a woman? Because when you look at things as 50-50, it becomes very difficult. If I'm uh, gonna wait for the other person to do this before I do that, instead of thinking it as like it was a partnership of both people doing 100%, right? Um, and covering the times where the other person isn't so, so hot or when I'm not doing so hot that uh, we're both going along the same path together. Good, good. Yeah, Carla. I was just gonna say, I think it's a lot of, um, it's like a spiritual battlefield. Because from the very beginning, God chose this, and even in a perfect setting, they still sinned and wanted something different. And so when you're, I think when you're single and looking for someone, um, there's those little temptations, even just with the sexual intimacy and different things that you are convinced and tempted like oh this is okay like between this but then when you become married those things that were so wonderful the attack is completely opposite satan wants you together before but then once you're together he's like no this isn't good this is what god designed I'm in the first place i'm gonna you, yeah. tear you apart so right. i think it's more like a really spiritual battlefield right so. these are all true yeah john So I think uh, within a relationship, you have two sinful people coming together. And um, 
what's going to happen after that is you've got um, conflict, but the solution to that is, you know, looking at what God says and um, the example of Christ and as a man representing Christ in humility and putting your your wife first. And mm -hmm. it's not um, absolutely not what culture says, but what um, the Word of God says and right. what a um, man looks like biblically. Right. And also... Uh, as a woman, right? Physically. Yeah, you, did you hear the, the, the theme that was running? Why is it so hard? There's <laughs> because because of sin. That's why the fall, right? What happened that changed what Adam and Eve have to what we have today? The fall. Sin happened. That's what happened, and that's why love is so hard. That's why relationships are constantly at risk. Yes, Nancy. It's kind of uncomfortable walking up to this I, microphone. I, I understand. Um, I'm reminded, and I, Robert and I have talked about this a lot since before we were married, and I'm just going to speak for myself in saying that I fail a lot at this, but Philippians 2 says... Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And I'm thinking of the scripture, and I didn't find it, that says to esteem others as better than yourself. And mm -hmm. if you can do that in your marriage, that's a good s scriptural way to approach it. But we are sinful people, and, and we fail. Yes, no, that's, that's true. So, so sin happened, and, and sin is what leads us to not do what Paul admonished us to do that Nancy just read about. Sin is what... Uh, and, and, and the reality of, of there being a sinful battle, that, that, that we do have an enemy that seeks to destroy our marriages because, it, because it, it dishonors Christ in the process. And we are two sinners coming together, and when that happens, sparks are going to fly. And so sin and its outworkings, they bring so much misery, they frustrate our, our hope for the blessings of love that we're all seeking. We all... We all you know, every, every engaged couple, you know, you get around some couples who've been married for eight, nine, ten years, and you have to, yeah, it's like, don't do that. They're going to walk up and go, yeah, we'll just see what happens after, the, after you get back from the honeymoon. You know, we want to cast all this, all this reality into their starry eyes of, of love. And it's a shame that we do that, but that's, unfortunately, that is the reality. That marriage is a beautiful, wonderful thing but when you get down into the nitty-gritty of what makes a marriage beautiful and wonderful, it's a lot of hard work. And there's a whole lot of failure, and there's a whole lot of forgiveness, and there's a whole lot of overlooking sin and letting love cover it and so forth. That has to be done. Why? Because two sinners are coming together. And unless you realize that that work is going to be harder than you really realize, that's, then, then, then as is most the case, you, after that first uh, couple weeks of marriage, you're realizing, wow, did I marry the right person? That's what oftentimes you ask. Did I marry the wrong person? This is hard. I, I, I thought this was going to be smooth sailing. No. Sanctification is not easy. And God is already starting that process when you're coming back from the honeymoon. Maybe even on the honeymoon. So Genesis 3 is, is really one of the darkest chapters in all of the Bible. Because it, it tells a story of how Satan brought sin into the marriage relationship. And he, he figured out a way to destroy Adam and Eve. And it was to turn their hearts away from God. And he did this by first deceiving the woman, by persuading her that her desire, her, uh, desire to eat the fruit, the, uh, to, to desire to eat the, tr the fruit of the tree that God had forbidden. And this put Adam in quite a dilemma because 
Adam was faced with a very difficult choice at that time. Here, he's, he stood by, as we were hearing last night, with his hands in his pockets, men, as we were hearing about that, and let his wife do something that God forbid. And he didn't stop her. He didn't protect her. And then Adam's suddenly in a dilemma. He's faced with a very difficult choice. Am I going to obey God? Or am I going to risk losing this woman that he saw there's nobody else in all of creation for me but her and I just allowed her to do something that God forbid. Now who am I going to choose? God or my wife? The choice became between the gift that God had given and the giver. Between Eve and the creator. And verse 6 tells us what he chose. He chose his wife over God. He ate of the fruit. Eve was deceived, but Adam chose. And he chose his wife over God. And Adam was wrong. See, because we don't have to choose. Right? Instead of turning to God for help, Adam turned away from God, and that's why he fell into sin. So sin is, is the rejection of God's authority. Sin is based on the denial of God's goodness and truth. Sin involves idolatry. And in this case, case, Adam gave Eve the place in his life that was reserved for God alone. He made her into the ultimate object of his worship. And now that Adam had turned from God, she would have to be the source of blessing for his life. And guess what? Wives, as much of a blessing as you are, you're not the source of blessing in the marriage. You're a means through which blessing comes, but you're not the source. You're not God. You're not a goddess. And so that's why there's problems in marriage. So by turning Adam and Eve away from God, Satan undermined the foundation of their relationship to each other. And God was the true foundation for their love, and they had rebelled against the Lord, and the devil had lied uh, to them, saying that, that, uh, that she was made to be this suitable helper for him, and he and he looked at her instead of just a helper as to be something more. And so he chose her over God. And so he undermined this foundation. And the devil was saying, you're going to be like God if you choose these things. But that was a lie. And like so many others after them, they they would come to see that, that no human being is ever able to meet our needs and make us happy. So Christ alone can satisfy us and and. And, and the, the love that was ruined here and intended to be enjoyed now was in shambles. And it's the aftermath of this sin that we all now are living in. And so when we come back next week, we're going to start looking at not just the damages that were done, but the hope that we have of having these relationships restored in Christ. Right? So let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that we have because of Christ, that the sin that entered into the world through Adam and that we now live in and and multiply, God, that that sin can be overcome by the grace and the power of Christ through salvation and through the work of your Spirit in our lives. And that gives us hope because because we all know the sin that's in our own lives and, and we're all in marriages where we see our sin on display often. And so... It's to you that we must turn to be the husbands and and the wives that you have called us to be and to enjoy the fruit of marriage that you created it for. So, Lord, continue to teach us and show us more of yourself in Christ's name.